So um, event-related potentials, actually, or ERPs, are derived from EEG. So you you know you attach electrodes to somebody's you know scalp, um, and you record EEG. But you record the EEG time locked to the presentation of a stimulus event. So you present something and then record the EEG that follows, you know, with the brain activity that follows. So let's say you, um, you know, present a sound like, uh, like that. So you, you present, uh, and then record the EEG time lock to that stimulus onset. And then you record it again, uh, and time lock to that stimulus onset, uh, time lock to that stimulus onset. You do that like a hundred times. These are very exciting experiments, by the way. Um, and then you, uh, you average out all of those EEG recordings. And what you get are, uh, you know, anything that wasn't specifically linked to the processing of that particular stimulus event, that uh, sound that you presented, um, you, you get, you, that gets kind of um, averaged out, basically, by averaging out these hundred trials, right? And what you're left with are a pattern of, you know, up and down tracings here, of signals here, you know, of you know, various speeds and amplitudes happening at specific time points uh, or peaking at specific time points uh, that are known as event-related potentials that are related to the actual presentation of the stimulus. Um, and there are these early latency responses, for example, and then there are these later uh, latency responses, these late responses. Um, and, you know, after 100 milliseconds or so, you know, typically something that's been presented, you know, uh, visually or through audition or something um, is, you know, is being processed at the level of the cortex. Um, and ERPs are interesting because, um, you know, they can be uh, they can be influenced, particularly these these late later latency, um, you know, components um, by, you know, uh, aspects of whether somebody's attending, for example, you know, drugs can have an impact on these, for example. Um, there's lots of interesting ways you can sort of explore the brain's responses to specific stimulus events um, utilizing, you know, e -E, uh, ERP. Um, and, you know, one of the advantages of EEG and ERP is that they're relatively inexpensive technologies. There's no giant, you know, MRI facility or something required. Uh, you know, so, so it's, um, it's a more accessible you know, sort of technology. You know, another, another huge advantage of all these electrophysiological techniques, of course, is that you're, um, you know, measuring actual brain activity. One of the great things about an ERP, for example, if you present, eh, 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 you'll see these, this N1, this P1, you know, this N2, there's very specific, you know, ERP peaks that are generated um, and uh, they uh, correlate uh, with specific, you know, activity at specific times. So, so the temporal resolution, you know, of these electrophysiological techniques is, you know, excellent. It's millisecond to millisecond, you're recording electrical activity. Uh, you know, a disadvantage of a lot of these electrophysiological techniques, of course, is that, um, you, you know, spatial, like, uh, uh, kind of like mapping of where these signals are actually coming from is not so good. Uh, there's something called the inverse problem within, you know, in, uh, when you're talking about EEG and ERP. It's like you have a certain pattern of waveforms that you're recording from the surface of the scalp. And you could posit many different, you know, sorts of generators, you know, uh, activity, you know, within the brain that could lead to a similar, you know, scalp recording. Um, so that's the inverse problem, trying to go back from the scalp uh, uh, recording to the specific generators of that activity in the brain. But just to give an example of ERP, um, like for example, if you if you did present 100, eh, 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 you get a very specific pattern of you know, activity, but if you suddenly went eh, like a really weird noise, something unexpected, something novel, well, you generate another peak that would appear about 300 milliseconds after the presentation of the uh, 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 or whatever the weird sound is. I made another one. Um, it's called the P300 or the P3, uh, and this you know has a there's a frontal aspect of it. There's a there's a more posterior aspect of it, um, but it's uh, it's related to you know detection of novelty, you know something unusual or unexpected, right? And that can be you can imagine there are lots of ways you could use ERP 
uh, and sort of the study of the, uh, uh, you know, our responses to novel events, etc., uh, in various experimental paradigms. There's also um, clinical uses of ERP. Um, for example, the, um, the fact that we have early latency components to a response to, um, uh, uh, you know, an auditory stimulus uh, is useful um, for trying to determine, you know, where somebody's experiencing, for example, um, hearing loss. Like if somebody comes in and they say, I can't hear out of my right ear, for example. Well, those early latency components, when you're presenting a sound and you go like, eh, into the right ear, for example, and they say, I can't hear anything. Well, you'll see, you know, these early latency peaks and value, you know, ups and downs, basically in the recording and the what they call the auditory ERP. Uh, again, they have to play the sound eh, 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 like a hundred times, an average out, so you could see these tiny little peaks, right? They got to be amplified so you could really see them. Well, they each correspond these early latency ones, and they're really early, you know, you know before like you know seventy milliseconds, you know fifty milliseconds. Some of them are really early, like you know twenty-five milliseconds after the presentation. Um, they each peak actually is related to the processing of the stimulus, of the auditory stimulus, in a particular you know spot along the way, like you know the superior olive or you know the cochlear nuclei, superior olive or the inferior colliculi, um, and if the you see, like, let's see, the peak associated with the cochlear nuclei, with the superior olive, uh, but then it flattens out. Well, then you know there's probably something going on at the level of the inferior colliculi. So it gives you some clinical information using a relatively inexpensive, you know, technique um, to examine actual electrical activity of the brain with very high sort of temporal resolution. Um, the later peaks that you get, you know, the ones that, like the P1, the N1, the P2, the N2, the P3 that I talked about in response to novelty, for example, these are um, cortically generated. They're more task dependent um, and, uh, you know, they're more influenced by, you know, sort of cognitive or perceptual aspects. But these early latency components are invariant and they're fixed. They're linked to activity in specific subcortical networks and they can be very useful in determining where, you know, something is going wrong. Uh, in terms of this auditory ERP, uh, in the transit of auditory information, you know, from the cochlea, you know, to the brain.